So let's go ahead and start looking into the various means by which we'll talk about metabolism. And let's start with looking at metabolic pathways as a whole, and then we'll get into the energetics here in a second. So the metabolic pathways here are a sequential step-wise process that is enzymatically controlled that goes from step one to step two, step two to step three, step three to step four, all the way until we find and form the final product. Along the way, byproducts may be formed. What we have to remember is that the sequence of events has a specific order. We cannot get the metabolite for step five without having the metabolite being formed at step four, so on and so forth. We can't just haphazardly have these reactions taking place. The step that's going to control the direction or the speed of the overall metabolic pathway is called the rate limiting step. The rate of metabolism is dependent upon and determined by a whole bunch of key regulatory factors. The rate limiting step is going to allow for one direction reaction. It's going to work on a negative feedback based off of either concentrations of products or reactants. If I have too much product being formed, I'm going to slow down. If I don't have enough reactants, I'm not going to get to the product. The amount of energy that's necessary for the reaction to take place. If I don't have enough activation energy taking place, or if I don't have enough enzymes available to reduce the activation energy, I cannot have that pathway step occur. More often than not, these regulatory pathway steps are controlled and regulated by hormones and cytokines turning on or turning off enzymes via kinase reactions, or by the concentration of the intracellular metabolites that will dictate whether or not the kinase has something to react upon. Whenever we look at the metabolic pathways, we have to remember that there are two key rules that we have to follow. We have to follow the laws of thermodynamics, and we have to follow the laws of conservation of mass. The laws of thermodynamics tell me that energy can never be created, nor can it be destroyed. It can only be converted. I can only convert energy from a potential form to a kinematic form and from a kinematic form back to a potential form. I cannot destroy the energy and I cannot spontaneously create the energy. In this conversion, we never get 100% transference. The energy state is less after the conversion than it was before the conversion. That energy that does not get converted is going to be dissipated in our bodies. It is dissipated in the form of heat. The other law that we have to follow here is the law of conservation of mass. Just like energy, mass cannot be created and mass cannot be destroyed. The only thing we can do is change the molecular form that the mass is found in. That means that the individual elements that we see at the start of the reaction have to be equal to the individual elements that we have at the end of the reaction. We cannot form products from reactants we do not have. And this is where we're going to get key byproducts being formed in our energetic pathways. Chemical reactions that convert energy stored in fuels into usable energy for the cell are the energetic pathways. If they are being used to produce lost energy or heat, we call them thermogenic the thermogenic reactions, the thermogenesis that takes place during metabolism is what provides for the heat of our body. It's what generates the 37C core body temperature that we are attempting to maintain at all times. The efficiency of the system is based off of how I am doing my catabolism, my anabolism, my isomerization, my kination, and every other reaction that's taking place. In this, aerobic energetic metabolism is more efficient than 
anaerobic, energetic metabolism. In terms of fuel, lipids are more efficient than every other fuel source available. So let's move this general discussion into energetics, and we'll talk about the pathways as it holds out. So we start with some sort of fuel source. This fuel source is going to enter cellular respiration, starting off anaerobically and then aerobically. In the cellular respiration, we take a low energy form of the energy carrying molecule, ADP, and turn it into the high energy molecule, ATP. The ATP will then provide the energy for the cells to do what the cells need to do, whether it is work via mechanical work, chemical work, or biological work, or to produce heat for the body. Coming out as the products of cellular respiration are carbon dioxide and water. Of the cellular respiration, ATP is generally a byproduct of the chemical reactions, with the exception of the electron transport synthase. So let's talk a little bit about ATP before we talk about how we utilize these energy systems and these fuel sources. So ATP is a molecule that looks something like this. It's an adenosine, which is adenine and ribose, the same A that we see in DNA. Stuck to it are three phosphate groups. This is referred to as the high energy form of the molecule. The energy is found in the phosphate to phosphate bonds. Now there's two ways that we'll reference the phosphate, either as P sub I, that is inorganic phosphate, or as P with a circle. The phosphates have a slightly negative attractive charge to them. And so in order to maintain normal cell dynamics, we have to tightly monitor how much ATP we have, which is why when we're talking about energetics, we are not making ATP. We are regenerating ATP. The ATP is very tightly regulated. Intracellularly, we have approximately 5 millimoles per kilogram of body mass. In the entirety of our plasma, on adult average, about 5.5 liters, we have about 0.9 millimoles of ATP in circulation. The ATP that is in circulation is not there for energetic purposes. It is there to serve as a hormone. So how do we go about using this ATP and then cycling it back? Well, we start by hydrolyzing it to free up a phosphate. Freeing up a phosphate gives me 7.3 kilocalories of energy to do work by the cell. We will then go about reforming it. I can also reform this by taking two ADPs and sticking a phosphate, forming an AMP. And I can also do it by taking an ADP and an AMP and sticking together using adenokinase enzymes, whether it's AK or AMPK. And we'll get into that when we talk about the anaerobic pathways here in a second. In terms of the fuel sources, the energy that we get to derive the ATP molecules are going to come from carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids based off of the energy generated and energy potential within each mole or gram of that substance. 